I want to welcome everyone this afternoon to the Underserved Population Network call. Today is a webinar. I do want to welcome you from the entire HHQI team. I'm Misty Kevich, and I will be moderating today's Underserved Population call. The handouts for today's presentation are located either on HHQI's website under the UP webinar tab, but they are also included at the top of your WebEx. If you look above the speakers and panelists' names, there are four tabs, and the one on the right has your PowerPoint handouts that you can download. Today, there are a variety of new people that are on the present on the calls with us today. So I would, oops, I would like to kind of just quickly go over what Home Health Quality Improvement Campaign is about. We are focused on reducing avoidable acute care hospitalizations, improving medication management, as well as improving immunization. And with immunizations, I will give a little plug to tell you that our most recent best practice package was released earlier this month on immunizations and infection prevention. The focus, there is also a focus on underserved population and thus why we're here today. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. HHQI is a special project funded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And what we do is create and work on evidence-based practices around our topics of hospitalizations, med management, immunizations, and underserved. To provide agencies, either home care agencies and other organizations in a cross-setting collaborative to use the tools. They are free, there are free resources, as well as lots of networking opportunities, just like today. I do want to have a couple special announcements that we're very excited about at HHQI. We met a milestone um, just this month. We now have over 10,000 unique people signed up for the campaign, and it's still growing. Um, there are over 5,500 agencies that are participating. So we thank all of you um, that are registered and participating. And if you're not, please make sure you do register at HHQI and be involved with the campaign. This is our third phase. We've been doing this since 2007. The other exciting news, we have been saying this for many, many months, but Million Hearts, which is the national collaborative uh, from CDC and CMS to work on reducing 1 million heart attacks and strokes. Home health was not included in this effort that started, last, or started the fall before last. But home health is now invited to the table, and it will be coming through the HHQI national campaign. So we are going to be having two best practice packages that will be coming out, one in August, the 1st of August, and one in November that will have two of these topics in each of these cardiac re, um, BPEPs. So look for more information, but this is going to be announced very, very soon. The underserved population best practice pa package, which is the evidence-based tools, resources, and especially for leadership, a lot of information, revolves around four distinct populations. Uh, one is health disparities that involves a variety of types of health disparities, race, economic, et cetera. We also look at the underserved population. There are underserved regions. There are um, rural versus and frontier versus urban issues, um, dually eligible. Those patients are very much at high risk, as well as the small home health agency who has limited resources. So in this package, we do provide a lot of resources easy to use items and a, a lot of ways to increase your awareness and assessment at your organization. The package is located on our campaign website. To download, there are also additional resources, including a lot of videos, um, other uh, multimedia opportunities for you to use, some tests, et cetera. Now, the underserved population networking calls, what we're on today, are free teleconferences, or for some cases, they are webinars. We usually hold those one to two times a month. We focus on one of the specific topics within uh, one of the underserved populations. And in this case, today, we are going to be looking at people who have compulsive hoarding disorder. Um, 
The schedule is provided on our HHQI website. We'll be posting a new flyer shortly under the UP tab. And at the end, I will give you an update on the next two months that what we're going to be um, hearing from. The sessions are also recorded. We have excellent sessions from uh, previous sessions. You may want to go on and take a look to see what is there, but lots of good information for you to use. The other exciting news, next week we are introducing the update, which is going to be a new monthly newsletter. Um, it's going to be a short review with some current articles or resources with a link to take you to the original article. Uh, links for some you know, great resources and also just the upcoming networking calls. So kind of succinct, give you what you need, and keep you in, in the loop on what's going on in this healthcare environment. Today, let's get to today's topic because this is an extremely interesting uh, topic and very applicable to home health um, because we've been caring for these patients from all these years and just really did not realize the medical science behind it. So today I'm extremely excited that Celtic Healthcare um, will be presenting Dr. Patricia thompson and also um, Tanya Miller, and I'd like to introduce both of the speakers first. Dr. Ney received her Bachelor of Science degree in Zoology and Psychology from the University of Maryland in College Park before completing her medical school at Ohio State University. She completed her family practice internship at Georgetown University and a family practice residency and geriatrics fellowship at George Washington University. Dr. Ney is certified in family practice, geriatrics, hospice and palliative medicine, quality management, and also as a home care physician. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Family Practice the Academy, uh, American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and the American Institute of Healthcare Quality. Since 1999, she's also been certified as a medical director. Dr. Ney is the Celtics Healthcare's medical director for the Maryland region. Her clinical expertise includes managing patients in their homes, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, psychiatric group homes, psychiatric hospitals, and patient hospice units, and acute care hospitals. She's worked as a geriatric hospitalist for seven years. Dr. Ney has held medical directorships at multiple nursing homes, hospices, and home care agencies, as well as a hospital-based palliative care service. She currently provides geriatric and palliative care to homebound individuals in Montgomery County, Maryland. I know you all would like to have her as your medical director and seeing patients in your areas. We're also pleased today also to have Tanya Miller. Tanya received her master's in physical therapy from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science, her doctorate of physical therapy from Temple University, and is presently pursuing her PhD in administration and leadership from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Tanya is the Eastern Region's Vice President for Celtic Healthcare. In this role, Tanya is the administrator for both hospice and home health care, and she supervises a multi-state interdisciplinary team, as well as overseeing the virtual care program. In addition to her administrative role, Tanya coordinates the educational pathways for rehab services internally and provides external educational series that covers a variety of topics in home health care, rehab, and, medic and management. She is also an active member of the American Physical Therapy Association since 1992, has served as the Home Health Section's news editor, and is currently the vice president and the program chair for combined section meetings. Tanya has provided national presentations to a wide variety of aspects on home care topics and has also had the opportunity to publish many articles in industry magazines. Finally, Tanya plays a very active role as a community volunteer leader. She, along with other healthcare professionals, founded the Pennsylvania Vent Camp in 1994. Pennsylvania Vent Camp is a week-long camp for children who are ventilator dependent. The camp is free to the children and provides respite care for the children's families. Tanya is a member of the Board of Directors 
and oversees the fundraising and community awareness of all the programs of the camp. So we have two extremely qualified speakers today on our call, and we're very pleased to have them. I will come back towards the end to give you some upcoming announcements and also instructions. The social workers will be provided free continuing education through Celtic Health Care's program today, and we will talk about that at a later slide. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Nay. Thank you, Misty. So today's topic is compulsive hoarding, and this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because of the clinical um, course I've chosen in my career. So the objectives for today are to define compulsive hoarding and discuss the levels of compulsive hoarding, to discuss the clinical presentation and physiology of compulsive hoarding, and to demonstrate knowledge of appropriate treatment interventions and support for the individual with compulsive hoarding. Dr. Nay, try putting your mouse on the slide first and see then if you can get it to, to move. Okay. Thank there you. There we go. So those are today's objectives. So this talk is broken up into various sections, the first being the definition of compulsive hoarding, various statistics. We'll look at symptoms and behaviors, the etiology of compulsive hoarding, and the whole field of neuropsych studies that now surrounds it that adds to our knowledge base. We'll look at the diagnosis and assessment, the various levels, the belief systems of compulsive hoarders, how home health might fit into the, um, to, into the treatment, various interventions, and management. So let's get started with the definition of compulsive hoarding. The acquisition of and failure to discard a large number of possessions that have limited value, that limited living spaces are sufficiently cluttered as to prevent their intended use, and there's significant distress or impaired functioning due to hoarding. And it's all three of these components that are, are considered part of the definition because I think some of us on this call may start feeling like we may be compulsive hoarders based on one or two of these bullet points. If you think of someone who's an antique dealer or collector or works at flea markets and sells a lot of items, they may have cluttered space um, and have a lot of items they don't discard, but it has to be all three of these to get to the definition. Compulsive hoarding is different than most medical conditions I deal with because in this case, the, the situation could pose a significant risk to the health, safety, or the maintenance of housing for an individual or their family. So often on the more serious cases I'm involved in, it's not just me as a home care physician or a medical director of a home health agency, it's many other services from the county that get involved. The next series of photos are from one of the individuals I treated who was involved with compulsive hoarding. And I put these photos in um, because it was a different kind of case. This was an elderly woman who lived at home who was able to only walk short distances with a walker and standby assistance. And she had a younger student living with her to help care for her and care for the house and she could be left alone for short periods of time. So I had noticed while I only went in the house and went into the room, the dining room where she lived, where the hospital bed was, I only was in a very small portion of the large house. But I noticed increasingly insect infestations and rodent problems. And um, the day that I sat down on a piece of furniture and a mouse ran out across my lap, I decided it was time to call the county in to get some help here. I asked my 
patient, if I could look through her house, I'd only been through part of it and, and I wasn't understanding what was happening. So this was the room where the student lived and when I opened the bedroom door, this is what I saw. So um, there's very little space to step over this pile to get next to the bed. And you can see there's just enough, you could barely get both both feet in over these piles. So you would step over it in that little space in the bed. It was a full-size bed and that's where the students slept um, in a fetal position, basically curled up between their belongings. Um, this was the far side of the bed and then possession stayed on there. And what's hard to appreciate in this photo is these ceilings were quite tall. It was an older house and these windows are quite tall. So there was quite a number of possessions around here. This was the far corner of the room and this was over five feet tall in the corner with all these piles. And this was the, the worst side. This was when you first came in the door to my left. This was piles that were well over my head. I couldn't reach the peanut container at the top. But what I immediately noticed um, when I went into this, this bedroom is that there were, there were actually tunnels where the rats had tunneled and burrowed through all this. So there were mice and rats and I'm not sure what else living in this room. And so this was obviously one of the problems in her house was this room. And it turns out that the student actually was a hoarder and throughout the house various rooms that my patient couldn't get to anymore had turned into something like this. And so, um, it created a problem for my patient who, um, although she wasn't the actual hoarder, um, she kind of participated in this practice and um, enabled him to do this. And on this case that I just showed you, it actually had a good outcome. In that case, we got home health involved and I'll talk about it a little later in the presentation. But we were able to get a little help for the student and for my patient and get the house cleaned up so she could live in a, in a, in a safer environment, not worrying about the infestations. So let's move on to some statistics about compulsive hoarding. This disorder affects men and women across all socioeconomic and ethnic groups. And there's 0.4 to 2% of the population have hoarding behaviors. It doesn't mean they have compulsive hoarding, but they have some behaviors. And this can start as early as age 10, and the severity often increases with age. The weighted population prevalence is 5.3%. And 50 to 85 percent have a first degree relative who is a pack rat. 26 to 54 percent have a family member with obsessive compulsive disorder. When we look at the symptoms of hoarding, you, you see how they start interplaying with one another. So you have somebody who has an urge to save things, to save the mail, the newspaper, um, whatever comes into their possession. At the same time, while that's bad enough, they have difficulty discarding these items. So they don't want to get rid of the mail that came in, all that junk mail that we throw out without even looking at who it's from, we just throw it in the trash can. So that combination of saving everything and not discarding things, you start acquiring more and more clutter and you have a limited amount of space to save all that. There's also indecisiveness, perfectionism, procrastination, disorganization, and avoidance. And so all these things, when they're trying to figure out what they can discard, they aren't sure if they may need it in the future. They aren't sure whether it's the perfect thing for something that uh, will happen next week. They may decide it's not the right time to do it, and they may have trouble sorting through all this. So these are the basic core symptoms you'll see with compulsive hoarding. Some hoarders have excessive buying. 
so you may um, I've, I've had more than one that um, all the um, the online and television programs that sell mail order supplies um, and sites you can win auctions on they may just collect lots and lots of big lots of things from the, there and end up with many boxes, perhaps all unopened from, from these places. There may be ac excessive acquisition of free items. Um, a familiar um, practice among my hoarders who live in apartment buildings is that they like saving newspapers. So not only do they save no their newspapers, they're usually the one in the building who says, I could use the extra coupons or I'll take care of your newspapers and we'll actually take a little cart through their buildings and get all the extra paper from all their neighbors and bring it back to their little apartment to save. Uh, they may save plastic bags or paper bags from stores. Um, so all, all sorts of things that come across our paths every day that we don't have to pay for. Their shoplifting behaviors on occasion. And all these things are very pleasurable to the hoarder. So it really um, is very um, rewarding to them to buy one more thing online or order one more item, and it really decreases their anxiety and gives them pleasure. When we look at theories of hoarding behavior, there, there are multiple theories, and not all of them fit um, everyone. So it could be a combination. So it could be emotional trauma that led someone to this hoarding behavior. It also could be a child of a hoarder. You saw the statistics earlier about the percentage of relatives who are pack rats or have hoarding behaviors. It could be due to genetics or brain abnormalities. And it may be um, other diagnoses that include hoarding as a symptom, so not truly a distinct compulsive hoarding disorder. You'll see similarities with compulsive hoarders to impulse control disorder, and it's related to the obsessive compulsive spectrum of disorders. But it, can, it is a standalone diagnosis. And not all compulsive hoarders have obsessive compulsive disorders, so that's important to remember. When we look at studies about linkage, you'll see that it's linked to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, various types of dementia, brain injury, anorexia, and intellectual disabilities. So we do see some linkages to those conditions. That being said, we all realize that all those individuals with those conditions do not have compulsive hoarding, only a small proportion would. Compulsive hoarding is a discrete disorder, as I said. While there are linkages and it's related to things, it is a standalone diagnosis. And we, we now know that there are abnormal neural systems that mediate decision making, attention, organization, and emotional regulation. So we know that we can look at their brains and see that they function differently than other people's. And I want to go into more detail on some of these studies. When you send a compulsive order for a full series of psychological studies, what you're going to find is this, that they have worse spatial attention, they are worse with visual and verbal recall, they are less effective strategies for visual recall, they have less confidence in their memory, they have more catastrophic assessments of the consequences of forgetting something, they have slower reaction times but they also have greater impulsivity. So these are common findings with the psych studies for the compulsive hoarders. Um, so we have something that has a genetically discrete, strongly heritable phenotype. The neuroimaging studies and the neuropsych studies we talked about show it's a distinct from obsessive compulsive disorder. And there's dysfunction of the DACC, we'll talk about that in a minute, and other areas of the brain 
And what, what's in common with all these areas of the brain is that they mediate decision-making, attention, and emotional regulation. There's um, a series of compulsive hoarders who developed it secondary to brain lesions, and this gave us insight into what areas of the brain were involved. So there are individuals who had um, damage to the orbitofrontal cortex or the medial prefrontal cortex that developed hoarding as a result of those injuries. Also individuals who had an anterior communicating artery aneurysm that ruptured had who had no hoarding behaviors before, developed hoarding after this ruptured aneurysm. On occasion, they had a few case studies after an olfactory meningioma was removed that compulsive hoarding resulted. And probably the most common of these, although all are infrequent, is frontotemporal dementia. Um, and individuals with that disorder, as they progress, you may see compulsive hoarding behaviors. So the most common area um, that we see dysfunction on the imaging studies is the DACC, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. It's part of the limbic motor cortex and it governs response selection how we make choices about things. It's what we all use for conflict monitoring, for what we're paying attention to, what we want to do or not do, kind of the higher executive functions. And that's what's not working for them. What's not working for them is what do I need to save, what can I throw out, um, why do I need to keep this, and that this, this is outside of the norm. And that's not working in them and we see that on our studies. So the DACC will actually mediate the hoarder's difficulties with how to make those choices. It also ties into their past experiences, how to counter their fears and anxiety, and it sustains their behavior. So as a compulsive hoarder starts getting anxious and stressed due to daily life, as we all have those every day, there are things that stress us. How they calm down is they may go and collect newspapers and bring them back to their apartment and keep them. And that decreases their fear and their anxiety. And while that may not make a lot of sense to us, we all do something at the end of the day, whether it's playing with your kids, petting your dog or cat, um, sitting down and having a snack or a drink, watching television. There's something we do to get that anxiety, uh, to relieve the anxiety. So for the hoarders, the way they have found to do that is usually accumulating more stuff or at least by not throwing it out. So the DACC also is what modulates their distress about losing positions, possessions. So I put this slide in. I actually use this in multiple talks about not passing the buck. Um, I think in healthcare, whether it says on this slide hoarders, smokers, individuals with obesity, you could put a lot of words in there. But you don't avoid these hard situations and hope that the next agency or provider addresses the issue. If we did that with smokers, if, if the busy office-based physician said, you know, I'm not going to make any difference with Mr. Jones and his smoking, I've told him a hundred times, I'm not going to tell him again. So I really don't need to worry about it, or my nurse is going to do it, or the technician or the front desk person will do it, or they'll see the brochure in the lobby. Um, that's passing the buck. If the hospital doesn't address it after Mr. Jones has a heart attack and doesn't talk about the smoking, they will avoid it. And if everyone through the system decides that, that, that they alone can affect change, it's very tempting to simply do what you have to do just to get them out of, um, out of your facility or through your program. And I think, as with any chronic condition, it's our responsibility to work together to deal with it. And so, whether it's compulsive hoarding, smoking, or obesity, we really need to do what we can to address the issue while we're caring for that individual and make sure the transition includes a plan for it.
So usually when I meet a compulsive hoarder, it's through a home visit. And, and I want you to think about why that would be. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to figure out who a compulsive hoarder is in an office-based setting. So individuals are coming in to the office. They look the same as you and I. It's not that hoarders look disheveled and disorganized. They may be the cleanest, neatest people that show up. Uh, we don't usually ask screening questions about compulsive hoarding and ask if that's a problem. We may ask about depression. We may ask about other things, but we, we don't, that's not a normal question we'd ask. So they could be going to the doctors for decades and no one in the healthcare system would know about it. When a doctor goes into their homes for a home visit or a home health agency or hospice shows up in the home to see somebody, you have this sudden realization that this person likely has compulsive hoarding. And so you need to establish that diagnosis. So home health, hospice, home-based physician, nurse practitioner, or PA who goes out, we have to figure out if, if it is a compulsive hoarding situation. So you rule out a psychotic disorder, dementia, and depression as the primary cause of clutter. I've had folks that I thought were compulsive hoarders that were instead so chronically and severely depressed, they just kind of deal with all this stuff coming in and it accumulated. Um, I've had patients with dementia who forget to do things and again, everything's accumulated. One of the questions that I ask folks, like if I see multiple piles of newspapers that appear like they may be trash or bags of trash, I'll say to, to my patient, would you mind if I, I go down the hall to the garbage chute and throw those away for you? And sometimes they say, yeah, that would be great. Um, and they have absolutely no problem with me carrying their trash out because it's, it's just they simply couldn't physically get out to do it or just emotionally couldn't pull themselves together to get rid of the trash. We'll also be establishing medical diagnoses and we would then determine whether based on all this information, um, whether there is a diagnosis of compulsive hoarding. Part of the assessment I would do uh, would include these items, and this would also be included on a home health visit when, when the admissions nurse would be assessing a, a, a compulsive hoarder or someone who may be a hoarder or lives with a hoarder. So as part of this assessment, I'm trying to figure out how much clutter there is, the types of items that are saved, their beliefs about their possessions, information processing and how they think through things, their ability to make decisions, um, whether they have good organizational skills or not. And I can tell you that some compulsive hoarders are the most organized people um, that I've seen in the sense that they have plastic boxes or cardboard boxes with everything meticulously labeled and in stacked perfectly on shelving units throughout their home or their basements or their barn or their garage. Um, there may be avoidance behaviors we have to assess. And then we're going to look at their daily functioning, their level of insight, their motivation for treatment, um, social and occupational functioning, the level of support from friends and family, and their medication compliance. And really, most of the things in column two we're looking at for everybody. For me, if, if the hoarder and, or the decision maker consents, I will get baseline photographs. Photographs are an objective measure of the living environment and we can use them throughout treatment. And I don't do this for everybody, but for selected individuals that I think it may be useful for down the road, I would do it. So if I go into a home and I'm walking through narrow trails that, at, uh, that through the home and you have to turn sideways to walk through and um, the piles of stuff around me are higher than my head is, um, what I will do if they'll let me is take photographs and then we actually will take photographs with, with an individual or some um, piece of furniture or something that's stationary there so they can see how tall the piles are 
um, in relation to that object. And so it's also very helpful because in the area where I work, many of the children live out of state and out of the area, so they're managing things over the phone for their parents. And I think a picture is worth a thousand words. And I think me calling the daughter in California to say, your mother in Maryland has a problem with compulsive hoarding. When's the last time you were home? And she has piles of stuff everywhere, all the way up to my head. I think you get an idea of what's happening when I say that, but if I actually send photos to the daughter in California, I think it becomes immediately clear that there's a serious problem. The other reason why photographs could be important are for some of my cases where adult protective services is involved or the guardianship program in our county, um, they would use those photographs in court to show the judge just how bad this was. Um, because people can describe things differently, but the photographs can be very helpful. But as a reminder for you guys, make sure you get your consent for any photographs that you take. One of the other things I'm doing on every visit, not just the first one, is is there an immediate safety or health concern um, if for the patient, for other family members or caregivers living there, or for any pets? Um, and if so, we, I need to contact adult protective services, children's protective services, and maybe code enforcement or the fire department. Um, animal services or, or other agencies as indicated. And at one time or another, I've called every one of the agencies on that list. Um, I, I think um, a, a very um, scary time for me was when I went out to the home of a compulsive hoarder who collected antique guns um, and sold them, um, uh, very old guns. and. So he had guns and ammunition in his house all throughout, over 2,000 weapons. And uh, he also stored, he collected empty propane tanks. And they were all throughout the sunroom, the back porch, all around the house. And he had a very large home, about 4,000 square feet plus the basement. And I did not call code enforcement from the house, but I ran into them and mentioned to them in the fire department, like, well, thank goodness he had, you know, nearly empty or empty propane tanks with all that, you know, all this other stuff, and he had all these newspapers on top of it. And when I described this to the fire department and code enforcement, they got very quiet and decided they needed the man's address because near empty or empty propane tanks are the ones that would blow up, not the full ones. And with all the flammable items and everything else and his, the closeness of his house to his neighbors, it was a very dangerous situation. And we, will, we were able to um, get, get that resolved actually within um, a few days for his neighbors, which probably didn't realize um, how dangerous things had become. And it was also scary because he used to light candles in his house at night and fall asleep with his candles lit. So it was just a, an accident waiting to happen, and we were able to intervene and prevent any problems. So when I go into a home with a compulsive hoarder who lives there, what I fill out is called the clutter hoarding scale. And in our references later on, you'll see where you can get this. And this is published by the National Study Group on Chronic Disorganization. And they break this up into five different levels. And each level, you're assessing four characteristics. So what you're looking at is the structure and zoning issues, um, damage to the walls and the floor. You're looking at pets or rodents or, or um, insect infestations. You're looking at household functions how the kitchen and bathroom are and whether those rooms can be used for their intended use. And you're looking at sanitation and cleanliness overall. And so the way that this clutter hoarding scale works, there are these four different categories and you rate them and they give you a description of what it looks like. You match it up with the description, like they're clear walkways. Um, you have to step on things on the floor. Um, there's 
uh, the smell of urine, or there's actual feces. And they go through and they describe all these situations. You then can map it out on the scale and decide what level of hoarder that, hoarding situation that is. And that's very helpful when you're interacting with code enforcement, the fire department, your local adult protective services office because they understand when you say that it's a level four hoarder what that means. So I want to go through what the interventions usually are for the different levels of hoarding. And for about the last 18 years, I've been working with compulsive hoarders, and um, I am often down on level four or five with my cases, but we're going to start at the beginning. So a level one, is what many of you see with um, their piles of stuff. There's more things than should be in there. Um, and that would be a level one hoarder. Um, they still are using most of their rooms for their usual function. So to intervene with a level one hoarder, there's no special knowledge of chronic disorganization. You can kind of maybe negotiate certain things, work with them. The family could work with them, and, and that, that may work. For level two, you start requiring professional organizers or others with training in chronic disorganization. By level three, you start needing a network of community resources for mental health that, that include mental health providers. And level four, this is usually what mine are, um, you need many resources to help make the household functional again. So you're often calling in pest control, um, crime scene cleaners, because there may be urine or feces from the patient, family members, or pets, or other animals, um, and you need to get things out of the uh, floor, subfloor, drywall, furniture, those kind of things, so the crime scene cleaners come in. Uh, they probably need financial counseling and licensed contractors. And the difficulty with, with many of my compulsive hoarders is they're older, medically fragile, um, homebound individuals, and they, they have a lot of equity in their home, but they don't have a lot of cash to fix this up. So it's a challenge for them to go to the bank to get a large loan to hire all these contractors to fix their home because they have no cash on hand and when the banks see what this home looks like or hear about it, um, they may be reluctant to um, loan out that money. So that's where the financial counselors come into play. And level five orders um, uh, need social services, mental health services, zoning, fire and safety, landlords come in, get involved, Often guardians may get involved and lawyers on many sides, family, the individual, um, the county or the state. And you often require a written strategy and contractual agreements to do all this and sometimes the home can't even be saved. Um, so it, it's, those are often the cases I get involved with. So getting back to other interventions, the medical management we're going to talk about briefly and some medications. Um, I, I talk a lot about different medical conditions and when you start seeing long lists of different drugs that might help, what that usually means is there's no one drug that's going to work for most of the people. So here's some things that may help certain individuals. Um, the first would be an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. We usually use that for depression or anxiety or obsessive compulsive disorder. So for those hoarders who may also have obsessive compulsive disorder, this medication might be useful. The tricyclics like clomipramine and other ones um, may help. Uh, they tend to help more in those individuals who have concurrent depression. The difficulty with tricyclics are that they have more side effects than some of the newer medications. There's also the SNRIs, the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, like the laxacine, the Fexor, 
and it um, may help those individuals who have concurrent depression or perhaps anxiety, but again, all of these need to be um, selected based on maybe concurrent symptoms and see, um, and a, really a trial to see if it makes a difference. There's some other potential medications that show some promise with compulsive hoarders, and those include the cholinesterase inhibitors and psychostimulants. And the reason why these two groups of medications show promise is if you think back to earlier in this talk, we, we talked about the, the area of the brain called DACC, and these particular drugs increase activity in that, that portion of the brain, which may correlate to better function. So there are studies going on in these areas, and there is some hope that this may help some individuals. So we've talked a little bit about the, the, the different ways you can approach hoarding with medications, but before we even decide what interventions might be tried, early on this is what we're asking and we're reassessing throughout the treatment. We're asking what's the hoarder's insight into their condition and what's the hoarder's willingness to make a change. And this is one of these slides I use in many talks because it could be about smoking or obesity or any other word you want to put in here. Some compulsive hoarders occasionally stay. They know they're a compulsive hoarder, but often they, they don't um, realize that they have that diagnosis. And beyond that, there are different levels of insight. Um, I have learned to ask general questions when I meet somebody to figure out where they're at in their disease. And so with a compulsive hoarder where there's no chair left for me to sit on, I'm standing in piles of newspaper, the smell of urine is overwhelming, the house is filthy, and I'm afraid to put my bag down for fear a rodent might climb into it, I will say to them, so, um, uh, you know, who does, who, do you do your own housekeeping? Um, or um, how are you, are you keeping up with, um, you, you know, keeping your home in order? And I will ask general questions about that or the condition of their home. And I will have people say to me, oh, I just love keeping my house neat. So it will be a neatly dressed woman sitting there on the only chair in the room surrounded by all these materials and smells insisting that this is, you know, she's always been a great home maker and housekeeper and she's doing a great job. And I'll then press her with questions like, well, do you think you ought to have some empty chairs for people to sit on when they visit? Or do you think that um, you should have more room to walk through here? And so um, surprisingly, some of these individuals in the worst hoarding situations I've seen do not think that their home looks any different from the average American home and they have absolutely no insight into it. But it's important to figure out where they're at and really meet them where they're at. Um, and the second part of this is what is the hoarder's willingness to make a change? Even if they have some level of insight, that doesn't mean they want to change their behavior. And, and this would be much like my, my annual visit to my doctor where he says I'm 10 or 15 pounds overweight, given whatever year it is, and that I, I need to lose weight. And I know I'm 10 to 15 pounds overweight. I'm a physician. He didn't have to tell me that. Um, and I know how to lose weight, and I know what is healthy eating, and I know um, how I could make this work, and I know how to exercise, and I know all these things. But am I willing to do it at that time? And so it's, it's, unless there's a crisis in an individual's life, they often aren't ready for a change. So we know from studies that someone who is hospitalized with their first heart attack or first pneumonia are more likely to t stop smoking when approached during that acute crisis than all the other times before because all of a sudden they had something really bad happen to them and they're in the hospital. So they may be willing to make a change at that point. And for the hoarder, um, it may be that I'm meeting them because they went to the hospital 
they um, fell, broke their hip, went to rehab. They were there a few weeks. Now they're at home, and they, there was a home health order for them. And the home health company shows up and realizing, it realizes it's a compulsive hoarding situation. And they really need to rehab, and they really need to be walking again and getting their endurance built up. But in order for them to get the services they need to go on with their life, they need to get this home health company to work with them. And so you may find them at sort of a crisis point where, yeah, if I want to be walking again, get back to driving my car, be more independent, then I need to figure out how to deal with some of my hoarding behaviors. So it's essential to figure out where they're at kind of with their insight and change to determine how much you're going to be able to do. So part of talking to the hoarder is getting a sense of what their belief system is. Some hoarders mistakenly believe the items are very valuable. They may know that the accumulated items are useless or they may have a strong personal attachment to the items which they recognize have little or no value to others. So it's varying beliefs about their items. And specifically, you can have various, there are different kinds of, of groupings we do for this, sentimental, intrinsic, and instrumental. So a sentimental hoarding behavior, that's a, someone who holds on to objects because of past memories, has connections to that. The intrinsic quarter, um, the objects have an aesthetic appeal, and they, they like them, and it's of some internal value to them. And you also have instrumental hoarding behaviors where you perceive you may need them in the future. Um, so this could be um, holding on to um, newspapers because they believe they may need newspapers for the cat's litter box or to look up a historic event or for whatever, and they hold on to them because in the future at some point they may need them for some reason. And it's usually not just one of these behaviors in somebody, it's usually a combination of reasons they're keeping things. So what has value to a hoarder? What, what might they save? And it, you name it, and they probably have saved it. So common ones you see are newspaper, junk mail, and empty food containers. And I can tell you one of the scariest things to have happen is for someone who's well-intentioned to order a meal delivery service to an elderly patient's home, not knowing they're a hoarder, so you get lunch and dinner delivered, and you have all these bags and containers, and when they run out of room in their refrigerator, they just leave them out on the counter, and they never throw these items out. And that can turn a very bad situation into a crisis situation within weeks. So you have to be careful about ordering those home-delivered meals. It may be plastic bags that are saved. It could be empty or full cans of soda. Um, I had somebody who, who loved gr uh, a granola type bar and they saved the wrappers for them and they actually taped the wrappers, they took it, carefully opened them up, took the bar out, ate it, taped the wrappers back together, they were empty, and then would put them in a certain direction in the cupboards and it turned out they had an entire room that when you opened every cupboard it was just these empty granola bar wrappers that had probably been there for years and lots of insect and rodent activity in that room. You may also um, find dead animal carcasses, not just of animals that died there, but I've had two hoarders that when they found dead animals on the road or in their neighborhood, they brought them the carcass home into their house. Um, they believed that was helping them and um, they, they let the rotting um, carcass in their home. And probably the most unusual case that I have seen um, was I had one case where a woman collected her own human feces and urine. And this was a very um, well-educated um, woman who had a PhD who worked um, for the federal government, who was very, um, very bright. 
and her children all lived out of state and no one had been to the family home in years. And on the phone, she sounded fine to everybody. And she actually had a yard service that maintained her front yard. So nobody knew what the house looked like inside until they started smelling ammonia, um, which took years actually. Um, so when Adult Protective Services got into her home um, and I went out with them, uh, what we found was this, that she had collected newspapers, some empty food containers, uh, plastic bags, paper bags, some of the usual things. But what was very unusual that for four or five years, this woman had only ever urinated or defecated in her home, never in an outside place. She always returned home because she believed her feces and urine were very valuable and she had to save them and she couldn't flush them down the toilet. So she got the um, at one of the local hardware stores, the big, um, I believe they're 20 gallon white bins to mix paint in and she would mark on there the first day she urinated and defecated in this big plastic bin and the last day and then had them all organized through her house. And as you can imagine, the smell and what this had done um, to the inside of her house was terrible. And um, I remember having my first conversation with her and she uh, was a very well-educated, articulate woman who saw absolutely not only nothing wrong with storing her urine and feces this way, but was very traumatized by us opening the lid to see what was in there and moving it at all and really um, very stressed by having us in her home. So I want you to think, as bizarre as some of these behaviors may sound to you, I, I want you to think about your own possessions So. If, if you have items that you may need later, um, you're afraid that they may disappear. It may be an umbrella for a rainstorm or boots for when it snows. Um, you may be afraid about making a wrong decision about what to keep or to, to discard. And you may get very anxious when your items are moved or thrown away. But I want you to think about right now where you guys go. We talked about at the end of the day what you do to relax and get rid of some of your anxiety. Think about in your home right now where it is you go when you just want to hang out and not be stressed. And for me, it's the corner of my sectional sofa where I get under my blanket and I usually am reading a book or watching TV. And in that room, when I think about what's around me, that room I have a lot of family photos in. It's usually the room that my dogs are in. And um, it's just, it's, it's a comforting place to me and, and I have important things that sit around me. So if I came home tonight and my husband got rid of my sectional sofa, the dogs aren't allowed in there anymore and all my family photos are gone, I'm going to be traumatized, I'm going to be angry, I'm going to be hurt, I'm going to feel betrayed. And the same reaction that I would have to that or you would have if your spouse or loved one got rid of these things without talking to you, that's the level of anxiety they have. And that's pretty traumatic. If you think about all your photos of your kids disappearing, that would be devastating to you. So that's the kind of reaction that you're going to get when you start moving things around with many compulsive hoarders. So we, um, Adult Protective Services and I usually refer to cleaning up a house as a clean out. And you have to really look at the risk and benefits of doing this. Um, so while the out of town children may think, oh, this is not a big deal, we'll just clean the house out once and mom will be fine. That's not how it works. Mom's going to be devastated. Um, the compulsive hoarder may be traumatized, angry, feel betrayed. There may be a permanent loss of trust, and it may be the end of the relationship. So when I have adult protective services involved in the case, they're usually the bad guys. They're usually the ones where the social worker or the nurse say, we're doing this, and that lets me, the doctor, or the children say, oh, this is terrible, Mom, but Adult Protective Services is cleaning it out. And we would only do that when um, 
there are certain times you may have to. So if the health and safety of who's living there is at risk or at the public, then you need to, to probably do it. But you try to involve the hoarder as much as possible and to debrief them afterwards and really support them through that process. So um, I think I think that um, it, it, it should be done sparingly when that's kind of a last resort because I have seen literally two dumpsters full of stuff leave someone's house and within two or three weeks when I go back for a visit, they've managed to accumulate all that stuff again. Um, so it's uh, they, they just will kind of increase their acquisition phase if you get rid of it. So the next section, we're going to go through the role of the home health agency, and Tanya is going to talk about the special roles of the different team members. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nay. Um, as, as Dr. Nay had mentioned, this next section, we're going to spend some time taking all of the information that she has presented in the first hour and kind of pull it together um, to give us some strategies that we can help as clinicians out seeing our patients um, who have compulsive hoarding, and also from an agency perspective and how do we support and educate our team members so that they have the strategies that they need to provide the best care to an individual who has compulsive hoarding. Just, there we go. So as Dr. Ney has mentioned and given a couple examples, um, compulsive hoarding can be a, is a chronic disease that can be fatal. And this um, newspaper clipping from 2011 in a Pittsburgh paper is just one example of this. Unfortunately, this elderly gentleman died in his home because firefighters could not get to him in time. And he was unable to get out of his home due to the compulsive hoarding. He was unable to get past the uh, stacks of of papers in his home and um, unfortunately the front door was blocked because the door had to open inward and the items blocked the door from being open. So this gentleman passed away in his home in a tragic way in a fire because we were un they were unable to get to him. So it really can be a very serious condition. Um, I'm not sure, can you all hear me? We've lost some um, audio connection. I'm not quite positive um, what's happened. Um, if you guys can just hang tight for just a second. And I tell you what, while we figure that out, and Tanya, you might need to call back in. And for some reason, um, I do have some questions that we could go ahead and talk to Dr. Nay until we can get Tanya back. Okay. Um, all right, Dr. Nay, the first question actually comes from Paige Mintz, and she was referring to your, one of your statistics slides early on when you were talking about um, 0.4 to 2% of the population have hoarding behaviors. And she was wondering what accounts for the large range of the percentage. Dr. Nay? Yes, Misty. So okay. the range is, it depends on, these were all studies throughout the United States, but it varied um, and there wasn't seeming to be regional variance. It was just the different studies that I reviewed had different prevalence. Perfect. Thank you. We have more questions for you, Dr. Nay, but I believe Tanya's back, so we'll hold those until um, Tanya's finished or until we come to the end. Tanya? Tanya. Okay. 
while we continue to work on that, I do, Dr. Nay, I'll have another question for you. So we will go ahead and um, hit another question from Hillary Finch. What does it mean that hoarders have more catastrophic assessments of the consequences of forgetting? I'll repeat that for you. What does it mean that hoarders have more catastrophic assessments of the consequences of forgetting? So what that means is for most of us, throwing out a handful of junk mail, we don't even think twice about it. For someone who's a hoarder, who someone throws out a handful of junk mail from the day, what that may mean is they may have a full-blown panic attack. They may believe that something very bad is going to happen. Um, they may go out to the dumpster and crawl through it trying to find the pieces of mail that are there to bring them back in their home. It was a way to help kind of control their environment and decrease their anxiety. And so getting rid of it, they just overreact. So it's more like overreacting, like I said, if someone took away your most valuable possessions and your favorite place and home, we would be that upset and it would be catastrophic. Um, and that's how they react when these, these items that may not appear very um, important to the rest of us are removed. Great. Thank you so much. Tanya, let's try and see if you are back audio-wise. They must still be working on that. So I'm going to hit, have another question for you, Dr. Nay, from Jennifer Lepley. She's a social worker, and she says, please share known resources that are available for treating hoarding from the psychological perspective and also the physical perspective. And you just talked, began to talk about cleaning up the home, and that was her question. Um, and we actually will get into that when um, later in the talk about different interventions we may do because as with many chronic diseases, there's not one single approach. So the treatment plan is really multidisciplinary and multimodal and pulling in all kind of resources, approaching it from all different aspects. So um, we'll get into it later about kind of the chronic disease management model and how that may be applied to compulsive hoarders. Perfect, perfect. Um, Tanya, let's see if we have your audio back. Misty, I think something wrong, um, something may have gone wrong on her end. It doesn't seem that she's ever disconnected, so um, I'm not sure. Okay. If maybe she just lost her um, telephone, maybe a storm or something. So we, we may not be able to hear the rest of Tanya's presentation unless you'd like to take that um, for her. I, I will okay. take it for her. Very good. Thank you. Okay, and Misty, if you can um, switch the slides back to me, I'll continue. Very good. Okay. Um, so let's go to um, this slide. So. With home health agencies, the administration needs to provide education and support for the clinicians because um, we all know how hard everyone in the home health industry works providing care for individuals in their homes. Um, and in this case, we're not only asking them to do all the paperwork and all the services they usually they provide, but additionally, they have to deal with this hoarding environment and smells that are not comfortable. And we need to acknowledge that for our staff and let them know they're supported. And some agencies may have special programs for hoarders and designate special individuals on the team who are comfortable dealing with them. So for home health goals, there are really three. The first is you have to accept the hoarder as an individual and not reject them personally. And as easy as that may sound initially, that can be very difficult because when I think back to the woman that collected her urine and feces, um, it, was, it was actually very hard for me to bond with that patient. 
um, because I, I realized I was keeping more of a clinical distance from her than usual because of kind of my repulsion to what she was doing. And it really took me a long time to get past that, and it really wasn't until I started meeting with her in another setting that I was able to get over that. But we need to learn as home health staff to go in and really say, okay, this place is really disgusting and very repulsive, but this is the individual I'm caring for and to, to accept them. Secondly, we want to recognize the disease and provide care in the same manner as other chronic illnesses. Um, and third, we want to transition this case to programs and providers for long-term management if the hoarder agrees to that. So really, those are our goals in home health and trying to manage the compulsive hoarder. So as I alluded to earlier, we often use this chronic disease management model. And, and we talked about obesity, smoking, you can talk about diabetes, um, any of those diseases that we're used to applying a model to. And compulsive hoarding is a chronic condition that has acute exacerbations, which is not unlike the other conditions I mentioned. The, we often use multiple forms of education. It could be written, verbal, phone, in person. And we have to provide that education at an appropriate pace and level. And that gets back to where is their insight and are they willing to make a change? And how, how do we give them this information? And lastly, to provide the patient with the needed tools and resources for where they're at in their level of, of understanding and willingness to change. So this basic model is how we would approach someone with, with a compulsive hoarding disorder. And we talked about this, the diabetes, CHF, COPD, but it really, these are all conditions that we, we don't cure, that people struggle with lifelong dealing with this, and when we're under stress, it affects these conditions. So the chronic disease self-management model, we teach the skills they need in the day-to-day -day management of their condition, and our goal is to either maintain or increase your, your life activities and your quality of life. And really the key to this is that for self-management, we want the individual to, to own the management. What we know in home health doesn't work anymore is um, going out, doing things for patients, making, getting them through a crisis, enabling them to continue their, their, their um, bad habits, and disappearing from their lives. And, and that's, well, we may have gotten them through the crisis. I think we missed some wonderful opportunities to change their life and change their habits. And so our goal really is to teach them how to take care of their diabetes, that they need to know what signs and symptoms of high and low blood sugar are, how to give themselves insulin, when to call the doctor, how to understand what foods you can eat and not eat, and really teach them how to do it themselves. And that's where home health is so crucial in empowering them to take charge of that. And it's the same thing with compulsive hoarders. Home health or counselors or doctors are not going to be there all the time, so it's important to give the compulsive hoarder many different skills and ways to deal with them this condition lifelong. So in chronic disease self-management, the first thing we do is we use techniques to deal with frustration, fatigue, pain, and isolation. Um, we would um, give them exercises for maintaining and improving their strength, flexibility, and endurance. We'd make sure there was appropriate use of medications, um, effective communication with family, friends, and health professionals. We'd look at their nutrition, and we'd evaluate their progress. So this is the outline of kind of what we would do for this. And some of these interventions would start very simply. When we talk about number one with dealing with frustration or isolation, um, it, it, it may be teaching them just to, to, take, um, to take a deep breath and, and learn to take a break and kind of uh, sit down and kind of reevaluate things. 
but you'll see that this is a very broad approach to this. This is about eating right, exercising right, taking the medications that are appropriate the right ways, and giving them feedback. So for interventions and treatments, um, the management of the hoarding requires this ongoing interdisciplinary multimodal approach. There's not one way that's going to work for any one person, and I would argue there's not just one intervention that's ever going to succeed on its own. You need different professionals at different times, and the problem with much of our healthcare system today is, and who's coordinating this management? If the patient or family member isn't kind of overseeing and leading this, is there a primary care physician? Is there a counselor? Is there a social worker? Um, who is actually doing this and trying to um, keep this moving forward? So with our home health treatment plan, we would use our weekly interdisciplinary team meetings to help coordinate care. So through all of our different disciplines, it's a way for them to talk about uh, someone with compulsive hoarding. And that individual in our agency would be on for each week to talk about this and really make sure we're on the same page. Um, if you tell a home health aide that someone needs to shower twice a week, and they go out and the bathtub is full of newspapers, um, they may innocently pick all the newspapers up out of the bathtub and make room in the shower for that individual. And again, they may have this catastrophic reaction to the newspapers leaving their bathtub. And so while the aide may be very well intentioned, it's crucial that, sh that he or she understand what the whole plan was so it's coordinated. It's very important for all disciplines to reinforce the treatment plan. It might be that PT and OT are in there more than the nurse, and they need to reinforce and remind people of things and, again, be on the same page with, with the hoarders. And we also, in the midst of all this, need to manage that acute illness that they were referred for. So a patient who had a total knee replacement um, is probably getting PT and perhaps OT to, to rehab this, um, but may also be getting mental health nursing or social work or other nursing interventions along with that. Um, so we're doing lots of different things, and we have to kind of pace those different activities for that patient. So in home health, we would have both the short-term and the long-term goals for this. We would, number one, want to decrease clutter if we can, um, improve their decision-making skills, improve organizational skills, strengthen resistance to urge us to save, and to give strategies to recognize the need for resources. So let, let's talk specifically about some of the interventions we may use. So. Um, Decision-making skills often is something as simple as, to us as let's go through your mail for today. So whenever someone from the home health agency visits, um, the uh, one of the things done during that visit is going through the mail. And it's deciding when they pick up a piece of paper, do they have to save it? Or can they throw it away and having their trash can there, a little bag, and when they throw it away, having their buy-in that you're allowed to take that out of their house and throw it away. And for some people, it may be their goal is pick one piece of mail a day that you don't need to keep. And it may take them an hour to figure out which piece of mail they can throw away, but it's supporting them through that and helping them do that and giving them reinforcement um, about that decision. And um, we also may gently challenge their kind of urge to save everything and see if we can logically talk them through the rationale for why they have to save all the newspapers. Or if you have to save the newspapers because it may be something historic, maybe the ads don't need to be saved. Maybe just the newspapers themselves. Newspaper So moving on to the next slide, um, th this is about the carrot and the stick. And um, 
this goes back to one of my earlier slides about insight and, and willingness to change. You have to know what the individual with compulsive hoarding wants, and you have to know um, what you're able to negotiate, and you have to pick battles and establish priorities. And this is when we talked earlier about willingness to change. If I have someone who had um, hip or knee surgery, was in rehab, and now is back home, and they really want to be able to drive and be more independent, they really need that durable medical equipment that I need to sign for as the doctor. They really need that done, and they really need to build up their endurance and graduate from the walker. And so you find out what's important to them, and I'll simply say, what is it that, what's the most important goal that you want out of all this? And it may be driving the car or being able to go grocery shopping again or um, being able to take a shower by themselves without a stranger helping. And so you have to figure out in pretty short order what it is that is important to them and what they want, figure out what's doable. And when I say pick your battles, um, you, you know, you ask the physical therapist how, how much of a space you need cleaned out for therapy. I'm not going to be able to get the hoarder to clean their entire first floor out. But maybe if I can get you a strip uh, to walk that's 12 feet by 3 feet, maybe that's enough. And so um, I think that you figure out what it is that's going to work best with that person and negotiate it. And I think sometimes doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants who do home visits have um, have a lot more leverage than other professionals because much of in healthcare needs our signatures. They need our orders to get medicine, to get durable medical equipment, to get other services in place for them, to get a handicap sticker for their car. And so we have a little bit more that uh, they need us for, so sometimes just by virtue of that, I can get them to do a little bit more than perhaps the visiting nurse or someone else might be able to. So in this section, we're going to go through some of the disciplines for the home health agency and how they might um, interact with someone with compulsive hoarding. So physical therapy um, is going to have to modify their exercise plans to meet, you know, the goals of that acute illness or condition, but in, re in the setting of this compulsive hoarding. So maybe one of the things you negotiate early on, the physical therapist says, okay, you really need to be able to get to the bathroom, one bathroom, the kitchen, and, and an emergency exit. And that may not all happen at once, but I mean, do they, are you going to say clear paths to every room in the house because you're probably too overwhelming? It may be that over time you negotiate this, this bathroom and then the kitchen and the emergency exit. So it really takes time to, to get buy-in for that. The therapist is always going to, is also going to look at the body mechanics. Um, related to their areas of clutter. And I, I want to challenge you with something um, that I've learned the hard way over time. Sometimes well-intentioned doctors may decide that you can just clear out all this junk and not make a single little path for an elderly person to walk through. And let me tell you what might happen. What might happen is the elderly person with poor balance who doesn't use a walker but held on to piles on both sides. When you move those piles, you move the furniture and they can't hold on to them for balance, you may see a huge uptake in falls because the only reason they weren't falling before is there wasn't room for them to fall. And so you need to think about that before you start just moving things around in their environment. Uh, the Trisha, Trisha, Tanya, I'm actually back. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Tanya. So I will let you pick up. Um, I'm on the assessed durable medical equipment. All right. I apologize for that. Um, 20 minutes of fighting with telephones to get back online. So hopefully, I will. Uh, I will stay back. Stay back online with everybody. Um, and thank you, uh, Dr. Nay, for covering that section for me. 
Um, as, as she was mentioning about clearing the paths and providing an open air way for a patient to get through the home, one of the things that we oftentimes do is we'll send patients home with equipment such as um, walkers or assistive devices that in the in setting of the inpatient unit may work very well, but in their home they may actually be a detriment to the patient. So one of the main things a physical therapist really needs to evaluate is what is a safe assistive device for that patient to utilize in their home environment. Although ideally we may want a patient to have such a wheeled walker or a wide base quad cane, the wheeled walker may actually be a very big safety risk for that patient. It may pull clutter along with the wheels. It may knock piles over. Um, and in order to clear the piles away from the area may cause too much stress for that patient. It also may cause that patient to be unsafe. They may have been guarding themselves with those piles because of their balance. And when we move that safety area away from them, they're at actually at higher risk to fall. So one of the main things that a physical therapist needs to do in the home when they first get in there is really assess what is the most appropriate assisted device. And then coordinate back um, with the physician in charge of that patient, especially if it's an orthopedic patient, to let that physician know that we may need to evaluate weight-bearing status and we may need to evaluate how we would ideally like the patient to ambulate because it may not be the safest way for them in that home. The occupational therapist is really key to helping the individual who has compulsive hoarding. Um, they're going to be looking at some of the very, very specific items that we all think about for occupational therapists, but are in a very unique situation in an individual with compulsive hoarding. One of the main things that we're going to want to assess right away in the home of a compulsive hoarder is making sure that they have adequate meal prep area and resources for appropriate meals. Oftentimes, kitchen areas are unusable or cluttered, or there may be outdated food um, in the home, which makes it unsafe for that patient. And a reaction to this may be instantly to want to have that patient have meals on wheels or have another um, type, type of meal delivery. But that could be very dangerous um, with the clutter and the hoarding event if that individual is then going to save those containers. So problem solving through that, providing a safe area to provide food that may not actually even be in the kitchen. Maybe it's in another living space and I'm um, using the small microwave, moving the microwave out of the kitchen or into a safer area to provide food and then talking to them about ways that they can have um, safer in nutrition. Oftentimes bathrooms are not accessible for these individuals. Um, and it's important to determine how, if the individual has the ability to adequately access toilet facilities. Um, it's really important that we make sure that they have that adequate access and that they're able to safely get to toilet facilities so that they're not at risk for increased infections and um, increased um, risk of skin breakdown from being in soiled clothing. And afford, of course, when we're talking about self-care ADLs and dressing and bathing, we want to make sure that they have adequate access to um, undergarments that are clean and um, will not cause skin breakdown and irritation. There may not be appropriate laundry facilities, and what can we do to help that patient and facilitate having clean undergarments? So these are some of the areas that the occupational therapist would want to address right away with our patients with compulsive hoarding. An area that the occupational therapist can really work in the long term with our patients with compulsive hoarding is problem solving. As Dr. Nay mentioned earlier, there's oftentimes issues with um, financial burdens related to the compulsive hoarding, not only with the potential cleanup cost, but also with the fact that compulsive hoarders oftentimes are also compulsive shoppers and may have inappropriate um, buying habits that have limited their finances and therefore they don't have access to adequate medication that they can purchase or that they may not have access to healthy foods and nutritious foods. So it's really important for them to help to problem solve with financial planning and to talk about strategies to make choices about what to purchase and when to purchase that. They also want to work on appropriate storage um, of their medications and access to medications. Um, the whole team is going to be focused on appropriate medications and making sure that that patient can reach their medications that they, they most need. But the occupational therapist can really be instrumental in, in helping the patient come up with a strategy to appropriately store their medications. And then finally, as we talked about, about planning around self-care ADLs and making sure that they are working with them on strategies to, to plan and to organize things that they need for the immediate 
um, interventions of the home health um, episode to make sure that that patient is safe during our care. It's important that when we're doing interdisciplinary planning that we really involve the home health aid in this whole plan. As we know, our home health aides are so instrumental in the care of our patients and really are the ones that spend the most, a lot of times the most time with our patients and really have the most um, intimate interactions with our patients. So it's really important that they understand the diagnosis and how compulsive hoarding is really truly a chronic illness and that we need to treat it just like we would any other chronic illness of a patient with heart failure or with COPD, that there may need to be certain adaptations to adequately care for this person. So it's important that they're involved in the interdisciplinary care planning and that they understand reasons as to why they may not be bathing that patient in their bathroom or that they may not be able to do the normal personal um, area cleaning um, and that they may need different strategies to effectively provide the care for the patient. So it's, when you're doing the planning, it's really important to have that aid at the table and get their feedback and their buy-in to the plan for the individual. Just like so many other chronic diseases, compulsive hoarding places that individual at risk for other medical complications. And it's really important that all team members are assessing the patient for other medical complications. And some of the key areas that we want to assess from a nursing perspective, of course, is medication management and safety and making sure that that patient has those adequate medications in the home and those medications are safe. Um, skin inspection, as I mentioned before, um, these individuals are oftentimes much higher risk for skin issues related to sanitation concerns in the home. So we want to make sure that they are, um, that the thorough skin inspection is being done of these individuals. Also, they may be at um, skin breakdown issues related to infestations in their homes. They may have fleas in the home or have other um, infestations that are causing problems with that patient's skin. So it's important that your nursing team as well as your other clinicians can identify the different types of bites and things like that that they may be seeing on the patient's arms or legs and being able to report that to the physician and get adequate intervention for the patient. These patients are at high risk for respiratory issues. There may be mold in the home, there's there may be infestations, and of course there oftentimes is increased dust and allergens present at the home. So there are very high risk for respiratory issues. Uh, so especially if you're working during the um, flu season and you're dealing with individuals who may be compromised medically from other diagnoses such as COPD or pneumonia, these individuals are going to be at a significantly higher risk for their respiratory issues. So we want to make sure that we're uh, doing an adequate assessment there. And then finally, your gastrointestinal assessment. Um, looking at the food that this individual is taking in and what's the nutritional value and also if that food is at risk to be contaminated or outdated that may cause other gastrointestinal upset um, or may interact with um, their medications. So it's important that we're doing a thorough gastrointestinal assessment of this individual. I cannot stress enough the importance of the role the mental health nurse can play in caring for an individual with compulsive hoarding. If you have a mental health nurse in your program, they really should help take the lead and guide the team on the best interactions for our patients and guiding the team on the best way to provide the care to the patient. Um, now, of course, you don't have to have a mental health nurse uh, involved in the case if you don't have one available to you, but if there is a mental health nurse in your program, it's very important that they are involved in helping to guide that patient's care and working closely with the whole team. And finally, another very key factor, key individual in our, in our team is our social worker. A consult to a social worker should be made first thing for the notification of compulsive hoarding. Long-term success, as, as Dr. Ney has mentioned, really relies on getting that individual access to community resources for treatment. Um, remember, this is a chronic disease with acute exacerbation, so it's important that we get the individual the help that they need and have strategies in place for when that home health episode is canceled or finished, that that individual still has the support that they need moving forward. And it's also important to remember, too, that oftentimes we may be treating a patient, and this is an example that Dr. Nay brought up in the very beginning of this presentation, we may be treating an individual who is, a compulsive, is not a compulsive hoarder but lives in a home with a compulsive order. So it is important that we give that person 
um, access to the services that they need and also have the social worker evaluate the safety of our patient in that home if that patient is being neglected or abused because of the situation that they're living in and do we need to have that patient removed from the home or give them other types of strategies to safely live in that home. So it's really important that the social worker is involved so that we can address these issues up front and provide the best care and the best interventions for our patients. We've talked a lot about what to do for the patient who has compulsive hoarding and interventions that we can provide, but it's also important from leaders in agencies that we support our clinicians. These are challenging cases to be involved in, and there's a lot of bias that may um, the, pay, the staff may have and prejudice that the, pay, the staff may have, and they may not understand appropriately why this individual may live in the circumstances that they live in. So it's important that we provide them with tangible strategies to help support the clinician in the home. The clinician may need to wear different clothes into that home and may need to change afterwards. They may need to do all their documentation and their collaboration that they normally would do in the home. They may need to do that outside of the home. And they may need their schedule modified so that they can see that patient at the end of the day and be able to go home and not potentially bring infestations to another house or things like that from leaving that patient's home. So it's important that the supervisor is working closely with the staff members and that they're coordinating care so that the staff members can feel supported and also be able to provide the adequate care because they feel supported in what they need to do to make themselves safe and feel comfortable in treating the patient. The other things that we need to make sure that we're doing is providing a protective equipment for the patient, for the clinicians. You know, they may need their shoes covered. Um, they may, may need to wear masks because of um, because of respiratory status in the home. Uh, we may need to provide them with additional cleansers. Uh, we may need to provide bug spray and things to make sure that they keep their their supplies clean and able to be utilized after this. I mean, obviously, there's the strategies of dealing with odors, and we've all dealt with that in the, in the home health environment, but really just being um, aware of that and really supporting the clinician so that they can feel comfortable providing the care in the patient's home. I have stressed the importance, we have stressed the importance of not only educating the patient, but also staff education throughout these slides. And there are other areas that we really need to make sure that we're providing adequate education to our staff so they're prepared for these, these issues. And this can be generalized to all patients, not just patients with compulsive hoardings, but making sure that we recognize fire risk. Uh, Dr. Nay brought up the patient with the, the propane tanks and understanding the different types of fire rate, rate risk that may be involved in the patient's home. Understanding the different types of infestation, recognizing different bugs. Um, we've recently had a onslaught of bed bugs in, throughout the country, and people become much more aware of um, bed bugs and what to do in bed bug infestation. But it's important that we are able to recognize these types of insects and that we are able to um, adequately handle being in a home that may have these infestations and when to report them um, and get additional help for that infestation. Also recognizing signs of animal abuse and neglect, as well as elder abuse and neglect. And that's especially important when the patient themselves are not the compulsive hoarder, but they are living in an environment with someone that's compulsively hoarding. We're just going to briefly go over um, a home health case study and hopefully get some feedback from the audience um, after we, I describe this home environment. Um, and hopefully um, I won't have any more technical problems uh, as we go through this. Um, Mrs. Jones is an 80-year-old female who was referred to home health services after sustaining a right femur fracture from a fall at home. Her past medical history is um, significant for COPD, anxiety and depression, and coronary artery disease, and she smokes a half a pack a day for the last 60 years. She has ordered um, home, home services for physical therapy and occupational therapy. Um, she lives in the home with her, with her husband. And prior to this fracture, she was independent with mobility, using a cane occasionally. And she's now par partially weight-bearing on her right lower extremity and ambulating with a walker. So we're going to talk a little bit. I'm going to kind of describe what the therapist sees in the patient's home. And if you can kind of imagine what you're, what you're walking into here, I'm going to describe basically what the physical therapist sees on her admission visit. In the initial, in the living space, um, it's clever, cluttered with piles to about waist height. There's a small area around the patient um, with her, where she's seated in her recliner. She says she spends most of the time in that recliner, including sleeping in there. 
Uh, the front entrance to the home is accessible uh, from the recliner, but all the other entrances have items stocked before them. So really, the only the front entrance of the home is accessible. The patient reports that she has three cats in the home, and while you're evaluating the patient, um, the cats are noticeable. They're walking around in the piles. Um, when you get too close to the cats, they hiss at you. They're not real friendly. And there's definitely a strong a odor of cat urine in the home. The kitchen area has um, a stove that's not working for some time. There is a garbage can present in the kitchen, but it is full and slightly overflowing. The counters and table are covered, and there's a medication bin um, in a small plastic bin on the table, and there's several bottles in this bin. Uh, the bottles are old, several of the bottles are old and outdated, and several of them don't have lids. And of course, both spouses' medications are in that same container. Upon inspection of the bathroom, the toilet um, has a bedside, to bedside toilet over top of it, and it can be assessed through a small passage in the hallway. The sink is cluttered, but there is running water. And when you expect the tub, there's cat litter boxes are, in the, uh, are kept in there, and those cat litter boxes are overflowing and have a strong urine smell. Uh, the patient does report that she's able to use her toilet, but admits since she came home yesterday that she's had several accidents because she hasn't gotten to the bathroom in time. So she's decided that she's just going to wear depends and, and she's been disposing of them in the kitchen trash. The bedroom has a very narrow path to get into the bed, and the spouse sleeps on that bed, um, in the bed, and, and walks through that narrow path. Upon um, assessment of the patient, um, a skin inspection shows that both buttock areas are reddened but have no open areas, but there are several small bites noted on the patient's forearms, and when asked about the bites, the patient says that she's pretty sure her cats have fleas. You notice the walker folded, folded up and left right at the entrance of the door, and when questioned about it, the patient stated that she had to go back to her cane because her walker knocked things down and got stuck on items, so she just started using her cane. She does report difficulty getting around with her cane, and it's painful and slow to move, so she hasn't been moving a lot from her, from her recliner. So what I'd like to do at this point is open up the chat line and just address a couple of the areas. First of all, what, what are some of the things that we might do initially to assess this, this, this um, environment to report back to the other team members? Go ahead and give some people some time to think about some things. And if you could just type, and we'll read uh, the responses. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and put that in the in the chat box. Okay, somebody's putting what family supports are available. It's a great thing to, to ask. Okay, somebody else is putting um, using a camera. Uh, somebody else said, I initially would want to make sure that the patient has at least two cleared exits, and I want to save for safety of her and her animals. Yes, and, and great. Fire, fire escape is, should always be one of your primary concerns. Let's see if we can get one or two more. Falls risk. General home safety check, including functional ability of the smoke detectors and exits. And that's great, making sure that we might have a smoke detector in the home that's working. Uh, you may also want to, as somebody else mentioned, taking, taking pictures of photos of the area so you can share them with the team to help problem solve. Okay, great. Um, what other disciplines need to be involved? Okay, we're also still getting great information back here. An emergency contact and working phone number, that's great. Somebody else mentioned the hoarding scale. Um, the, safe, the best of the patient's ability to ambulate safely. Okay, and here we go. We would want social work, PTOT, RN, and home health aid. Absolutely. This patient's going to need every dish of discipline. Um, we've got a lot of typing here. And speech therapy. Absolutely. And the person who types speech therapy, could you elaborate on what you would use for the speech therapist? Because I apologize, I didn't mention the speech therapist in my list, and they're very important in these cases. Spiritual counseling, support? Yes, for speech therapist, a cognitive assessment. So in a lot of our agencies, a speech therapist may um, do the cognitive assessment in, instead of the occupational therapist. 
Okay, Tanya, I know there is a lot of great dialogue going on, and thank everybody. But I'm not going to actually ask us to continue to move along a little bit because we have a lot of questions in the queue, and we still have oh, some wonderful. of our presentations. So, but these are great. Everybody can continue to put into the chat and um, into the Q and A's as well. I think we're all seeing some really good insight. Um, I do want to just mention one other quick thing, um, and everybody did, did a great um, response there. One of the things that I didn't see there is this patient, we recall, is partial weight-bearing. So one of the first things that we want to do is get with the orthopedic surgeon to address the partial weight-bearing and her inability to use a walker. Right, I'm going to go ahead um, and pass this back to Trish and um, for the remainder of our presentation. Thank you, Tanya. So this part goes kind of beyond the home health agency and what other services you may need to coordinate with now or in the future for this individual. And the first category is for care managers. And um, realize that the county I work in is in um, uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. It's very affluent. And I think we have more care managers than we have physicians in our county. Um, so the care managers can obtain the medical and psychiatric evaluations, um, assist with trauma, um, make sure there's a safe living environment. But they also kind of coordinate all this other stuff we talked about, like who manages the care. Who's going to facilitate this cleanup? Who's going to pay the repairmen? Who's going to take the estimates in? Um, which family members are responsible or neighbors are helping out? Um, they may help relocate valuables. And they're going to really put this overall plan in place and establish um, ongoing support services and kind of coordinate all these various people that are coming through to help with this. So if you're blessed with caregivers in your area and if your individual can afford to pay for them or if an insurance company will pay for it, um, that's helpful. And I actually have had some success over the years with some insurance companies. Usually when I send them photos of how bad it is, it's usually Adult Protective Services um, and myself will write a letter to the insurance company and we somehow get permission to get a, a, either a case or a care manager involved. So the next, um, the next intervention we may see is with cognitive behavioral therapy. So with CBT, you really are focusing on information processing deficits. So we talked about these abnormal emotional attachments that an individual with hoarding may have and avoiding some behaviors like throwing out or sorting through things or maybe challenging their erroneous beliefs about possessions. And it, it, it has, there are multiple studies that talk about the success of cognitive behavioral therapy um, for, for individuals with compulsive hoarding. You'll also see ERP, the exposure and response prevention being used. And this is really going through very um, well-defined tasks, like we talked about sorting the mail, so discarding safe material training yourself about how to make a decision about these things, and really restructuring how you think about that. And again, the best example of that is starting with the mail or the newspaper that comes in and how are you going to manage that, and then gradually increasing that as is tolerated. There are, depending on where you are in the country, there are additional resources. Um, adult Protective Services, um, hopefully, um, has the resources to help you. Some counties or cities have hoarding task force. Um, Heavy-duty cleaning services. Uh, and if you don't have heavy-duty cleaning services, you may find the, the companies that do crime scene cleanup in the area might be able to help you. There may be professional organizers. We all should have home health agencies available, um, care managers, psychologists, and they're actually self-help and support groups that you can refer not just the individual with compulsive hoarding, but their support network. I do want to spend a, a little time talking about heavy-duty cleaning. Um, this can cost, I mean, 
depending on how big the house is, I'm sure it would be over 300000 But um, I've seen with my cases that uh, the flooring, the subfloor, all the drywalls, sometimes ceilings, electrical, um, all sorts of things need fixed. So it can get quite expensive, and it may be the code enforcement decides um, it, it just needs to be taken down, and hopefully it hasn't reached that point yet. But the heavy-duty cleaning folks are a team of trained professionals, and they come in and know how to prioritize this and do this and, and should work with you trying to get this resolved. They often use subcontractors for this, like the plumbers or the electricians. Um, you may get uh, folks coming in to deal with the animal or the rodent or insect infestations. So it's really a team of professionals that come in and help deal with the issues. So the professional organizers, if you have them in your area, and not all areas do, they kind of facilitate getting the home decluttered and organized. And remember, I, I did say near the beginning that some of these people actually have organized clutter already. Um, and what the organizers will do is they establish categories for sorting possessions and where you might keep them and how you might organize them, create systems that are really individualized for that, in, that person because not every system works for everybody. And they may locate a permanent place for your belongings. So it may be that when you have a special collection of newspapers or um, empty soda cans or whatever it may be that you won't get rid of, maybe you can agree to put them in a storage unit or put them in the attic or put them somewhere else. Um, and hopefully it's, it's, uh, it's something safe to be in those areas, but they'd work with you to try to find something. And they, um, the professional organizers are so essential if, if you have that as a resource to really help deal with this chronically. And as I've said multiple times, and Tanya has said, the, it's really a multimodal treatment plan. So the compulsive hoarder, um, this is an individual who has a chronic condition, at times of stress, there are acute exacerbations, and home health care often shows up right when there's some kind of medical crisis or, or psychiatric crisis. So you're going to approach this from different standpoints. You're going to look and see, does cognitive behavioral therapy has, have a role at this time or in the future? For this individual, maybe they have obsessive compulsive disorder or concurrent depression or anxiety. Maybe one of those medications might help. Um, is there someone, whether that's the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, the professional organizer, whoever, is there someone who can help them with these organizational skills doing basic tasks like sorting through the mail? Um, you may do basic stress and time management training for these individuals to help them manage their day better and relieve some of the stress and anxiety that way. And what is so crucial and what we don't talk a lot about in this is for this to succeed, um, it, it takes the village for this. It takes family and friends to get involved and to, to give a support system to them. And just as I said, it can be difficult for me to kind of connect with some of these people once I've been in their house. Um, yet you have to learn how to connect with them as an individual and to really look past that hoarding. Um, and so, it's without you a support network being there, it's very unlikely that anyone's going to succeed with managing this long term. And um, so my two basic points, if, if this is all you remember, is that compulsive hoarding is a discrete disorder. It's not a subtype but something else. We have psychological testing and, and neuropsych imaging studies that show it's discrete. And that management of hoarding requires this ongoing interdisciplinary multimodal approach. And I'm going to go ahead and um, go show you um, two of the reference slides now before I take questions. Uh, these slides have some excellent um, 
references for you to learn more about compulsive hoarding, not just the diagnosis and management, but some more of the background. And there are websites here that have wonderful resources for the individual or their family members. Um, so please take time to look at those. And as I said, it's really about seeing past the hoarding or seeing past the obesity or seeing past whatever it is that's getting in the way of connecting with that person as an individual. So um, that's, that's where we all have to figure out um, where they're at, how we can help them, and really transition them to the next step and, and help them deal with this long term and to take ownership of this. So, Misty, I'm going to turn this over to you to go through um, some of these questions. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Ney and Tanya. Ex a lot of information. Also, I want to thank all of the um, participants today. We have a lot of questions, and we are definitely do not have time to address them all. I'm going to address a few questions, but I'm going to actually ask if Dr. Ney and Tanya, if I put these together in a Q&A, if you'd be able to address some of those. Um, for us, and we can post that later for all of the participants. Absolutely. Great. Well, there were several questions that were related to what if the hoarder doesn't believe they have a problem and don't uh, are not willing to receive help? What can you do, and what are some strategies to try to um, provide assistance with the family and caregivers? Um, Trisha, this is Tanya. I'll, I'll go ahead and just answer from a home health perspective. Sure. Um, just, just like with any other uh, chronic illness, oftentimes, uh, for example, a patient who um, we all know may need to stop smoking but has decided that they're not going to smoke and they don't see it as a problem in their life, it's all about negotiation and um, making um, – making negotiations with that patient about what you need to do to accomplish your treatment in your acute episode in your um, in your medical care. Say if that patient is referred to you because they have an open wound or they're referred to you because they have a hip a recent hip fracture. Um, making negotiations about certain things that you need to do to safely provide that medical care and then trying to give them the resources so that in the future if they are willing to work on that issue, that they have those resources available to them that they can move forward in the future. But really it's about um, seeing that acute medical condition through the lens of that chronic illness. Great. Thank you very much, Tanya. And, and Dr. Nam, I'm going to send this one to you. Um, there's two questions. Um, do you, has there been a relationship seen with depression and hoarding? or? Or and another question came, how about uh, linked to high IQs or lower IQs? Let me answer the question about the linkage to the IQ. They did not find a link to whether it was high or low IQs. There was no correlation. So you have people with intellectual disabilities as well as people who are on the high end of the scale with their IQ. So they did not see that. Great. Okay. And anything with depression? I'm sorry. I um. Any sure. association with depression? Yes. Let, let me address the depression. Let me address the depression. So on the depression, um, while there was, it wasn't linked to individuals who had major depressive disorder. What they did find is that hoarding behaviors became worse um, when individuals were depressed. So this would be a time of an acute exacerbation. And what they saw an increase in was the inability to throw things out. So you stop discarding things. So what that means is more things that are coming in the house every day, those things didn't get thrown away. So while um, th that would be the correlation that you may see worsening behaviors during a, a period of depression. Wonderful. And there are excellent questions, and so we will do up an FAQ sheet, and when we post it, we will let everybody know that it is there because we don't want to miss because there were some really good, intricate questions for home care and for you know working as a community uh, to solve these problems. And I, again, want to thank both Dr. Ney and Tanya um, very much for your presentation and your expertise today. 
I do have a couple quick announcements for social workers that are on the call. Everybody, actually, when you leave the webinar today, you will be sent to a um, an evaluation. Please take the evaluation. Very quickly into the evaluation, you'll be asked if you are a social worker. If you answer yes, then you will be directed to a list of evaluation questions and post tests that are specific uh, for Celtic Healthcare to be able to provide you the 2.0 CEUs that are being provided by Celtic Healthcare through the National Association for Social Workers. It will be available in recording. We'll have that posted um, early next week and that it will be available for CEUs even through the recording through September the 30th. So if you're unable to do the uh, post-test immediately after this session, you make sure that you do it as quickly as possible. And it will take about 30 days to get your certificate by way of email. It may be earlier, but you give them up to at least 30 days. Um, a couple other real quick announcements is our next call is going to be July 10th. It will be a webinar, and we will have the registration open in about two weeks for it. And it is on engaging patients with health literate care. Jennifer Pierce from Sutter's Center for Inter Integrated Care will be our presenter, and will be talking about self-management related to health literacy. And then look, do look for, uh, in August, we will be talking about African-American um, disparities. There are some additional H HQI resources. There is a live chat this Friday. If you've never participated, go on to HHQI, um, click under, I believe, networking. And it is a, from 2 to 3 in the afternoon Eastern time where you can ask any questions. There is no audio. It's just all chat. Um, and we can answer any questions for you um, related to any topic. We will be talking about the IHI's Pavior Path series that is now posted on, um, the, on HHQI. And do look for the upcoming news on Million Hearts. And again, we want to thank you very, very much for participating in today's educational session.